Hello, in case you've been living under a rock for the past year, this is the Seastar S50 telescope that took the astrophotography community by storm. It's a $499 smart telescope that's capable of taking images like this, which as you can imagine in terms of telescopes is very special and incredibly cheap. But imagine if you could knock off $150. What if you could make this telescope for $349 but still maintain all of the same features? Well that is precisely what ZWO have just done. This is the Seastar S30. It's a slightly smaller version of the S50, and yet it has the exact same features and a slightly better sensor to capture your images of the night sky with. In today's video, I'm going to be unboxing it and hopefully, and I mean hopefully, testing this telescope out for myself. I'm Damon Scotting, and this is Astronomical. Right, let's get started. Out with the old and in with the new. Let's make one thing glaringly obvious. This is not an upgrade to the S50. They have downsized the model slightly to make it more affordable to beginner astrophotographers, which let's just say it is bloody amazing because the features that they've developed for this tiny little telescope are all you could ever wish for as an amateur astrophotographer. You do not need an expert level of knowledge to be able to operate this setup. In fact, I could very easily see this being sold in supermarkets. So yeah, full disclosure before I start this video, this has been sent to me by ZWO and it has essentially been gifted for me to try out. I'm sure you'll be seeing a lot of videos like this posted by a lot of creators over the next couple of weeks where they're all being sent this telescope to post a review on. Um, but one thing you certainly won't be seeing until at least a week from now is people capturing images with it. And that would be especially true for people who live here in the UK and that is because we are shrouded in clouds basically every single night and quite often day. And also speaking more internationally, even if people live in deserts and whatnot, right now we're about a couple of days away from a full moon, which means it's the worst time to be imaging deep sky objects. But that doesn't mean we can't check out the telescope and have a look at the specifications of it. So we open up the box and we are greeted by some guidelines as well as the Seastar logo and a message that says your handheld observatory, which is a fairly cool statement. And this basically is your own private mini observatory. We have manuals for the Seastar S30. First thing to note is that the Seastar S30 will use the exact same app and interface as the Seastar S30. 50. So if you already have the app downloaded on your phone, well then that's perfect. That's very convenient for you. Here we have the Seastar S30. That is tiny. <laughs> I think I read that this weighs 1.65 kilograms, if I'm correct. Yeah, that's a decent design. Very sleek. Yeah, it feels like an expensive piece of kit, which is always nice. All right, so pop all the bits we don't need back into the box and get rid of the box. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put the Seastar S30 just there, and I'm going to bring back out the Seastar S50 just for a little size comparison. Yeah, okay. So as you can see, the height is very similar, but in terms of the actual build and width, the Seastar S50 is significantly smaller. There we go, hold down the power button and the telescope turns on. Right, so in this little black box we have some accessories that go with the Seastar S30. And the first one is a set of tripod legs, which feel very sturdy, which is exactly what you want, you want it to feel secure. Uh, with this being said, I actually have my S50 mounted on my windowsill, that's where it spends most of its time doing its observations. Just because that's really convenient for doing my observations, especially because as you can see behind me right now, we have a lot of very tall trees. So if I want to image stuff that's just coming above the horizon, it makes sense to do so from a high vantage point, which is why having it up there is perfect. And also in this little box, we have a solar filter, fantastic, and a cable which is a USB-A to USB-C. Now these are the tripod legs that come with the Seastar S50. And the first thing you probably noticed with me unboxing the Seastar S30 is that it doesn't seem to have a convenient carry case like the S50 did. This is the case that the Seastar S50 came in. It's a decent, strong foam case. That means that if you're carrying around your Seastar S50 with you, you're traveling with it, it is very well packaged. But I've already been told by ZWO that there is a bag included, but it hasn't been included in my package. So not to fear. Connection confirmed. Nice. Oh, it is exciting, isn't it? All right, and that's it, then I'm in. So now I have the option to do some stargazing, solar, lunar, planetary, or scenery. Wow, the Seastar S30 is insanely quiet compared to the Seastar S50, listen to that. I say listen to that, you can't hear anything. Mate, that's well quiet. I'm not really too bothered about the noise because the S50 is relatively quiet in itself, but that is actually surprising. Okay, let's take this off before we go any further. And look at that. Let me rotate the S50 around as well so you can get a good view of it 
we have two lenses on the S30. So that's already a big plus if you're interested in that kind of thing, but it's a handy feature and I've seen mentions of this being used for wide field Milky Way photography, which is a very exciting possibility to pursue this with. Hi. Sorry, Izzy's just closing the blinds because it's getting pretty late, which is exciting. Right, so continuing to move the S30 around, I think you can now see it on this camera. Jupiter is just over there to the left, a very bright point of light. And then generally it has been a sea of clouds that have completely blanketed my entire view of the night sky uh, for the first four hours of this evening. And uh, finally we're getting to see, getting to see some stars. Specifications. Now obviously, with the announcement of a new C-Star model, you are expecting upgraded specs. But the reality is, this model is 30% cheaper than its predecessor, which means really, we should be expecting a downgrade. But surprisingly, that's not really the case. In fact, there has even been an upgrade. In terms of what's gotten worse, we of course have the aperture. The light gathering capabilities of the scope have decreased due to its smaller size, which we know. The tripod, however sturdy, is a far smaller alternative to the carbon fiber tripod of the S50. I know you don't need a carbon fiber tripod for this new scope, but I thought it made excellent value as I used it for other stuff as well. So I suppose this is one of the ways in which they've managed to shave off some of the costs. The features are all the same. The glass slash lenses are the exact same. This is still a lovely triplet telescope with built-in filters to help bring out the nebulosity in certain deep sky objects and reduce the effects of light pollution. But as for the sensor, funny enough, that has received a slight improvement. The S50 used an IMX442, which has a 1920 by 1080 resolution and a decently large pixel size of 2.9 micrometers. The S30, however, uses the IMX662, which also has a 1080 resolution and 2.9 pixels, but the key upgrade is the full world depth, meaning the sensor will no longer become saturated as quickly as it did before in the S50. I suppose a noteworthy comparison of this upgrade would be the Play One Mars and the Play One Mars Mark II cameras, which each used the same sensors respectively before being upgraded. Now if you think about it, this is how much it costs just for the camera of the Seastar S30. I know this version is a lot more versatile, but the all-in-one package that the Seastar S30 represents is just astonishing. The fact that it can track and go to and, and stack all of these images and much more in the app is incredible. I think this aspect of the Seastar S30's release will get massively overlooked, but to reduce the cost by 30% and still keep all of the same features and slightly upgrade the sensor is a huge accomplishment. All right, enough of the specifications. Now let's start taking some images and seeing what this tiny scope can capture. So I pointed a telescope towards the Seven Sisters as my first target. This is an object that the Seastar S50 struggled to fit within its full field of view, so it makes sense to try this out and make the most of the 30mm aperture of the Seastar S30. Even though the clouds seem to have disappeared to the naked eye, they are still ruining my images. After only a few minutes of exposures, it quickly became apparent that a full moon and a thin layer of clouds were going to ruin my chances of taking some nice shots. I pointed the telescope at a pair of galaxies located in a different corner of our sky, M81 and M82. But again, same issue. Maybe I'm just going to have to pack up and try again in a week's time, when hopefully the weather's better and the moon is gone. Let's try one more target before heading in. How about the North America Nebula? Wow, okay, now we're cooking. That's a very clean looking image, comprised of 42 times 10 second long exposures that have created this seven minute long raw stacked image. But get this, I'd forgotten to turn on the Seastar's built-in filter, which supposedly reduces the effects of light pollution. I wonder if this will also help with the brightness of the moon. Bingo. That's a gorgeous shot. I'm very happy with that. After 40 minutes, the clouds started ruining my images and I decided this was good enough. So I moved over to the Heart Nebula and tried out the mosaic feature. The Heart Nebula is unfortunately still too big for even the Seastar S30, which means the added bonus of the mosaic feature will enable me to include the entirety of the nebula in one shot. To do so, it will carry out a process in which it captures successive overlapping images that slowly, but surely, complete the full picture. It's almost like over time you're just adding more and more puzzle pieces. It's recommended that in order to do so for a target as difficult to image as the Heart Nebula, you take almost two hours worth of images. And this is what it looked like after exactly 33 minutes. Obviously not complete, but it certainly shows a lot of potential. The scope really struggled with the Andromeda Galaxy, but do not fear, as I have saved the telescope's best images till last. Now with the constellation of Orion free from the obstruction of the trees, I could go after the Horsehead and Flame Nebula, as well as the Orion Nebula. 
I opted for the Orion Nebula first, and even using the live view, you could tell the Seastar S30 was going to make light work of it. This image right here is the exact type of image you see plastered on the boxes of all those rubbish, expensive, useless telescopes that companies try and sell. You know when they sell you the idea that you can see this when looking through a telescope, which obviously you can't because this is an image captured through the help of long exposure images. But even if you added a $4,000 astronomy camera to one of those telescopes, you still wouldn't be able to capture an image as good as this. Which is undoubtedly one of the things that makes the Seastar S30 so objectively amazing. I then asked the app to point the telescope a little higher towards the Horsehead Nebula. I then left the telescope to image for the entire night. However, I'd forgotten that the Seastar seems to cap your stacked images at just under an hour, so I really should have enabled the continuous shooting function and then stacked the images myself the following night. But look at that. Just under one hour's worth of imaging beneath a full moon. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So these are the collection of images I managed to capture on my first ever night with the Seastar S30. I wasn't actually holding out for anything at all, to tell you the truth, especially given the weather conditions. But to have taken images like this with a $349 telescope beneath some of the worst imaging skies you can imagine is an absolute dream. Affordable astronomy and astrophotography in a perfect little bundle. I did also use my Seastar S50 alongside the Seastar 30 to generate a comparison between the two scopes. I'll be posting a video about this over the weekend, and I'll also be posting a video about how you can edit your photos to go from this to this in just under two minutes for free. It's a really simple video that I'm excited to show you all, so make sure you are subscribed, and if you are interested in pre-ordering this scope, be sure to click the link in the description below. If you still find the S50 appealing and you haven't yet purchased one, I'll also include the link for that. But yeah, first impressions, I think ZWO have hit it out of the park again by releasing something $150 cheaper and capable of doing many of the same things. But yeah, from now on, this is going to be top of the list of beginner telescopes for under $400. There is nothing else in the market that comes close to doing what this can do for such a limited price. I think basically every single spare clear night that I have from now until the new year, I am going to be setting this up alongside my other telescope setup. So if you are interested in what I can capture with this telescope from my Bortle 6 garden, which is a fairly average garden, then make sure you're subscribed. Thanks for watching, I'm Damon Scotting, and this was Astronomical.